The Pediatric Patient. Oral health for toddlers, preschoolers, school-aged children, and adolescents depends primarily on parental intervention for the young child and gradually transitioning the child through parent involvement to independent management of daily oral self-care. Parents are provided with education through anticipatory guidance before a child's birth and at regular intervals thereafter, given, given the information needed to assess their child's oral health status. Taught how to intervene and to anticipate the child's oral health needs at various ages and stages of growth and development. Pediatric Dentistry. The Specialty of Pediatric Dentistry. An age-defined specialty that provides both primary and comprehensive preventive and therapeutic oral health care for infants and children through adolescence, including those with special health care needs requires two years of additional residency training after the required four years of dental school and dentistry for infants, children, teens, and children with special needs. The American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. The membership organization representing the specialty of pediatric dentistry and for general dentists who treat a significant number of children in their private practice, service as primary care and specialty providers from millions of children from infancy through adolescence. The American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry's, the AAPD mission is to advance optimum oral health for all children by delivering outstanding service that meets and exceeds the needs and expectations of our members, parents, and stakeholders. Professionals and parental information is also available on the AAPD website. The Child as a Parent. The age categories of pediatric patients are infants 0 to 1 year of age, toddlers 1 to 3 years of age, preschoolers 3 to 5 years of age, school age children, middle ch childhood 6 to 11 years of age, and then adolescents, young teens and teenagers 12 to 17 years of age. The dental home. Dental home is defined by the AAPD as an ongoing relationship between the dentist and the patient, inclusive all of all aspects of oral health care delivered in a comprehensive, continuously accessible, coordinated, and family-centered way. The AAPD, the American Dental Association, ADA, and the American Academy of Pediatrics recommend a dental home should be established no later than 12 months of age and include referral to dental specialties when appropriate. Emphasis is placed on oral health counseling and prevention. One out of 10 two-year-olds toddlers already have one or more cavities. Barriers to dental care. Availability of dental providers, which as accept patients' insurance in geographic area, office hours, and or willing to see children. Financial, income, dental insurance, lack of parental oral health literacy, and the importance of oral health language and transportation. Child dental visits. Purposes. The purpose of the dental hygiene visit are to establish rapport, teach appropriate behaviors, and prevent management problems. Develop and continue relationship with the child and the family. Initiate and or strengthen positive age-appropriate preventive measures such as fluoride usage, appropriate nutritional practices, and daily dental biofilm removal. Discover, intercept, and recommend changes in any parental practices that may be detrimental to the child's oral health. Appointments are planned for clinical oral examination, carries risk assessment, biofilm and calculus removal, professional fluoride application, radiographic assessment, treatment planning of dental disease, evaluation of developing dentition malocclusion, anticipatory guidance, counseling, and introduction to dental hygiene. Frequency of continuing care. Visits to the dental hygienist and dentist are scheduled according to the child's specific needs. A common appointment plan for children with little or no oral disease is every four to six months. Some patients may require more frequent intervals based upon the child's risk factors, historical, clinical, and radiographic findings. Reevaluation and reinforcement of preventive activities contribute to improved instruction for the parent, child, and the adolescent. Scheduling. The best time to schedule dental visits for toddlers and young school-aged children is early in the morning when the child is well-rested and more cooperative, after naps when the child is not tired and is more apt to listen and cooperate. Patient management considerations. Cooperation is usually gained with nonverbal communication such as smiling and talking with the child and the parent. Toddlers, one to three years of age. 
primary teeth are vulnerable to tooth decay upon the eruption of the first tooth, usually between the ages of six and 12 months. Children who wait to have their first dental visit until two or three years of age are more likely to require restorative and emergency visits. There are child-friendly terms that you guys can read about on your own. Oral examination, positioning for access. Utilize the knee-to-knee -knee positioning for the oral examination and teach the parent to utilize this position at home to provide thorough biofilm removal with toothbrush and floss. Prior to performing the examination, explain to the parent proper positioning. Child's legs around parent's waist, parent's elbows restrain child's legs, and parent holds child's hands on his or her stomach. It is the clinician's responsibility to control the head during the examination. Crying during the examination is normal behavior and can actually provide better visibility of the child's mouth and throat. Examination sequence. Examine the child's head and neck, legs, arms for evidence of abuse. Oral soft tissues are assessed. Lift the upper lip to observe the condition of the anterior teeth. Preschoolers, three to five years of age. Prepare the child for the dental visit. Make the dental visit as pleasant as possible for the child. Children are told that the dental hygienist and dentist help them take good care of their teeth. Parents are instructed to avoid using negative words such as hurt, pain, and don't be scared. When the child is not present, parents are asked if, they, if the child has any fears or has had any prior negative experiences. Positioning. For young preschoolers, three years old, utilization of the knee to knee positioning may still be needed may sit in the dental chair without any problems and can be encouraged with being a good girl or a boy. Dental chair possibly may be modified by removing the headrest or a portion of the backrest to better fit the child. Parental involvement. Determine the expected developmental milestones of the child according to the chronological age. Ask the parents to identify actual developmental milestones so appropriate management can be initiated during the appointment. Ask parents to provide a general statement regarding the child's temperament and ability to cooperate. Evaluate whether the parent needs to accompany the child into the treatment room or not. school age children ages 6 to 11 years of age. They can be an active participant in the dental care visit. May still display signs of anxiety and uncooperativeness. Typically, once a child is in school, school full-time, having a parent present during their appointment is really no longer necessary. Child's dentition may be all primary oral mixed dentition or by 11 or 12 years of age, all permanent dentition depending on individual development. Examine the need for pit and fissure sealants. A periodontal assessment needs to be completed if there is no bone loss. Child may have uh, pockets, bleeding, and subgingival calculus. Child is starting to develop independent skills and ability to perform their own oral care. Continue to avoid the use of negative words. Avoid lecturing or reprimanding with negative tone. Suggest, advise, and highlight the positive. Use of pictures for explaining proper oral hygiene, calculus, and biofilm may help the child understand. When teaching brushing and flossing techniques, demonstrate and, te um, and techniques to the child and have the child demonstrate their ability to perform and modify as needed. Adolescence, 11 to 18 years of age. Dental hygiene services provided during adolescence can impact oral health throughout the patient's lifetime. Adolescence dentition is all permanent dentition. Need to assess for periodontal issues and diseases at each uh, hygiene visit. May respond and wish to be treated as an adult or as, as children at different times. Are learning to adapt to body changes, sexual impulses, secondary sex characteristics, and independence. They may exhibit the difference characteristics to one degree or another. They may have anxiety due to family issues, such as divorce, school performance, sexual issue, issues, peer pressures, violence, or substance abuse. Concern over physical characteristics and personal appearance. Want to dress, be like their peers. Teachers, coaches, and health professionals can have a powerful impact with the age group. Additional communication strategies for motivating adolescent patients should be utilized. Components of the dental hygiene visit. Components of the dental visit are essentially the same for all pediatric patients. A clinical examination and diagnostic tools are utilized during a dental hygiene appointment to assess the child's overall oral health based on age and developmental milestones. The initial interview, new patient visit. Parents are seated in a quiet, private place so they can concentrate and feel comfortable while supplying the information requested. As rapport is established with the parents, an explanation is given as to why the information is needed. The initial medical and family history information is collected and reviewed. 
child and family medical dental history, family configuration, number of people in the household and the relationship to the child, other caregivers, the time periods and locations, socioeconomic status, and educational level of parents or guardians. Medical histories of the child. An accurate, comprehensive, and up-to-date medical history is necessary for correct diagnosis and effective treatment planning. Oral health problems. The child patient with diabetes, cardiovascular disease, a mental, physical, or sensory disability, or other systemic involvement requires special adaptations of procedures as described in other chapters. Dental caries and periodontal disease infections of parents and children. Intraoral and extraoral examination. Um, there are chi child age specific soft tissue and hard tissue conditions, pathologies um, that are significant in the dental hygiene care. Evaluate head and extremities for any abnormalities uh, in signs of child abuse. Developing dentition occlusion in temporomandibular joints. Evaluation. Retract the lips to expose facial aspect to evaluate cervical areas for demineralization. Assess and document amount of biofilm present and did any discoloration. Document tooth eruption delays compared with normal averages. Um, adequate spacing for developing dentition and then classification of their occlusion. Look for malformations and dental caries. Look for loss of teeth and conditions or pre present restorations. Evaluations of pit and fissures for indication of sealants or repair of previously placed sealants. TMJ disorder for clicking, popping, grinding, or discomfort upon opening, closing, or mastication. Indications for referral. Severely crowded, malpose, or congenitally missing teeth. Overbite, overjet, crossbites, or other malocclusion requiring intervention. Early life of primary teeth. This condition, if untreated, usually disrupts the eruption and alignment of permanent molars and premolars. Radiographic assessment. Radiographs are a valuable diagnostic tool to aid in the overall oral health and developing an individual's treatment plan for, of the infant, child, or adolescent dental needs. Radiographic needs. The dentist's professional judgment and the ADA Food and Drug Administration guidelines for prescribing needed dental radiographs for a child. A patient's age is not an indicator for initial radiographs needs. Each child is unique and the need can only be determined by the dentist after reviewing the patient's medical and dental histories, completing a clinical examination and assessing the patient's vulnerability to environmental factors that affect the oral health. Cooperation. Each child is different. Cooperation may depend on the age and previous dental experiences. Use of tell, show, do assistance of a parent, dental assistant or dentist, and or using holding devices will aid in taking any radiographs. Dietary assessment. A study of the child's diet and counseling relative to general nutrition and dental care control can provide important learning experiences for the parent, parent, child, or adolescent. When discussing diet with adolescent patients, responsibility is placed on them and their ability to make choices. Diet instruction suggestions. Advise on food choices for, from the most recent My Plate Food Guide. The use of the terms healthy versus unhealthy snacks instead of good versus bad snacks. The young child may not be able to distinguish the difference between good snacks and bad snacks for the teeth, such as cookies um, are good tasting but are bad for the teeth. Dental hygiene treatment. Purpose. Removal of biofilm stain calculus for gingival health. Educate parents and children regarding proper daily biofilm control procedures and other preventive measures. Types of dental hygiene treatment. The type of dental hygiene treatment provided for the child depends on the age and oral findings. The use of disclosing agents are essential for assessing and educational tools for school-aged children and adolescents. Perform at the beginning of the appointment to provide a visual tool for the children to understand the presence of biofilm and removal with toothbrushing technique. Frequency of dental hygiene treatment is based on the assessment of caries risk and periodontal health. Instrumentation. Presence of calculus is evaluated at each hygiene appointment for all ages. Removal of all local irregularities, including inadequate margins of restorations. When ultrasonic scaling is utilized for a pediatric patient with mixed dentition, it is only used on permanent teeth, never primary teeth. Ultrasonic scaling is effective for localized moderate to healthy calculus and orthodontic patients. Prevention, fluoride. Fluoride contributes to the prevention, inhibition, and reversal of caries. Professional application. Well water and non-fluoridated city water have tested for fluoride level. 
Use of non-fluoridated bottled water or water systems using reverse osmosis. Application of professional fluoride treatment is based on the child's caries risk. Children with moderate caries risk need to receive a professional fluoride application every six months. High caries risk receive a greater frequency of three to six months. Supplementation. Fluoride supplementation may be considered if fluoride exposure is not optimal. The ADA and the AAPD guidelines are used for supplementation recommendations. For children with moderate caries, over-the-counter fluoride rinses can be recommended as supplement to daily brushing. Prescription fluoridated toothpaste is recommended for children with high risk or who have numerous carious lesions on proximal surfaces. A daily application of a fluoride gel is a custom-made tray that may be necessary in select cases. Fluorosis. Dental fluorosis occurs as a result of excess fluoride ingestion during tooth formation. Enamel fluorosis and primary teeth fluorosis can only occur when the teeth are forming. Dental sealants. As many as 90% of dental caries in school-aged children occurs in pits and fissures. Dentition is evaluated periodically for development defects in deep pits and fissures that may contribute to caries risk. Dental sealants is evaluated for repair or replacement as part of the periodic dental examination. Complete information about dental sealants is found in a different chapter. Antibacterial therapeutic mouth rinses. Children younger than six years of age should not use mouth rinse unless directed by a dentist because they may swallow large amounts of liquid inadvertently. Uh, they are available over the counter and by prescription depending on the formulation. There are mouth rinses available that help reduce or control plaque, gingivitis, and bad breath and tooth decay. With the over-the-counter products, look for mouth rinses that have the ADA seal of acceptance. The seal shows that a product is safe and effective for the purpose claimed. Mouth rinses do not take the place of optimal brushing and flossing. Parent or caregivers of the child may rinse at bedtime with 0.12% chlorhexidine gluconate for one week per month to decrease risk of transferring cariogenic bacteria. Periodontal risk assessment, gingival and periodontal evaluation. Non-destructive gingival inflammation in childhood without appropriate intervention may progress to more significant periodontal diseases seen in adults. The risk of periodontal disease is lowered by establishing excellent oral hygiene habits in children, which will carry out into adulthood. Periodontal evaluation. Significant changes occur in the periodontium as the dentition changes from primary to permanent teeth. Periodontal probing, periodontal charting, and radiographic periodontal diagnosis should be considered when caring for adolescents. The extent and nature of periodontal evaluation is determined professionally on an individual basis. Routine periodontal screening and probing is indicated following the eruption of permanent incisors and first molars. The use of the periodontal screening and recording, the PSR method, can facilitate the early detection of periodontal disease in children and the need for a comprehensive periodontal examination. Periodontal infections. Significant changes occur in the periodontium as the dentition changes from the primary to permanent teeth. Adolescents are at a risk for periodontal infections and gingival problems. Careful probing and studying of radiographs are indicated for each patient. Emphasis is placed on preventive measures, <clears throat> early assessment, early treatment, and regular maintenance appointments. Development stages of gingivitis and periodontitis are developed later. Biofilm-induced gingivitis. It's the most common periodontal disease among children. The incidence and severity may increase during puberty. Clinical changes and hormonal changes related to increased dental biofilm. Exaggerated response to, to, to dental biofilm. Risk factors for periodontitis. Genetic factors, host immune factors, infrequent, inadequate dental and dental hygiene care, local factors, supergingival and subgingival calculus, dental biofilm accumulations, oral hygiene, personal habits of care, orthodontics, fixed or removable, pathogenic microorganisms, viruses, socioeconomic influences, systemic diseases such as diabetes, and hematological diseases, untreated dental caries and defective restorations, and the use of tobacco. Caries Risk Assessment. A caries management by risk assessment, CAMBRA, process uses a questionnaire to interview the parent and or the child in combination with other assessment data to determine caries level risk. The purpose, to identify and decrease contributing factors. Identify current protective fa factors. Classify the child's risk uh, level, low, moderate, or high, of developing caries. A communication tool with the parent or the age-appropriate child in discussing and eliminating these risks. A balance of risk factors and protective factors is needed to prevent a progression of caries as visualized. The principles, provide parent and parent 
patient education. Promote remineralization of non-cavitated lesions by use of topical fluorides. Modify oral flora to favor oral health by use of topical antibacterial therapeutic agents. Minimal restoration of cavitated lesions and defective restorations. The steps, complete a curious risk assessment based on the child's specific age rate related risk and preventive factors. Determine the level of caries risk. Implement Canberra treatment guidelines for children age zero to five years. Canberra treatment guidelines for individuals six years and older can be found later. Classifications of caries risk, low, no or little history of carious lesions, restorations or extractions due to caries, no risk factors indicated adequate protective factors. Moderate, history of carious lesions, restorations or extractions due to caries, but none the last two years. Some risk factors but show no signs of continuing caries could easily move to high risk some protective factors. <clears throat> high, one or more observable and or radiographic carious lesions present. History of carious lesions, restorations or extractions due to caries within the last year. More than two risk factors, inadequate protective factors, special needs, or medically compromised with parent intervention, continuous carious lesions, medications with diminished salivary function. Extreme, rampant decay, chronic medical condition, or special needs, hyposalivary function, numerous risk factors, none or minimal protective factors. Early childhood caries. The disease of early childhood caries, ECC, is the presence of one or more decayed, non-cavitated or cavitated lesion missing due to caries or filled tooth surfaces in any primary tooth in a child below the age of six. A child below the age of three with any smooth surface caries, white spot lesions or cavitated lesion is indicative of severe early childhood caries, S-E-C-C. This form of caries is usually seen in children who routinely have been given a bottle when going to sleep containing a cariogenic liquid, formula, milk, or juice, or have experienced prolonged at-will breastfeeding. Nursing bottle caries, baby bottle tooth decay, and rampant caries are older terms. The AAPD adopted the term ECC to reflect the multifactorial etiology. Children experience caries as infants, toddlers are at a higher risk for developing caries in primary and permanent teeth in the future. ECC case definitions uh, criteria are found later on. Prevalence, tooth decay, dental caries affects children in the United States more than any other chronic infectious disease. Tooth decay affects one in four children ages three to five and six to nine years who live in poverty. Microbiology. Dental caries is common chronic infectious tr transmissible disease re resulting from tooth adherent Specific uh, bacteria, primarily MS, lactobacilli in large numbers, are also in the dental biofilm. Transfer of MS from parent, caregiver, sibling, or other child by saliva sharing between the infant or young child. Colonization of MS has been shown to occur between uh, before tooth eruption and as early as birth. High levels of MS in saliva and dental biofilm are a strong risk indicator for ECC. Avoid saliva sharing behaviors such as kissing on the mouth, tasting food before feeding, cleaning a drop pacifier by the mouth, sharing sippy cups, toys, or utensils. The risk factors. The areas of concern related to disease indicated risk factors are listed la later. Teaching parents about the cause and effects of ECC is a significant part of anticipatory guidance. Predisposing factors. Placing bottle or sippy cup in bed. Bottle sippy cup contain milk formula or sweetened fluid with sucrose. Prolonged at will breast or bottle feeding as a sleep aid or behavioral control. Ineffective or no daily biofilm removal from the teeth. The effects, maxillary anterior teeth and primary, primary molars are first to be affected. As a child falls asleep, it pulls the sweet liquid can collect around the teeth. While the sucking is active, the liquid passes beyond the teeth. The nipple covers the mandibular anterior teeth, hence they are rarely affected. Recognition. Demineralization or white spot lesions may be noted along the cervical third of the maxillary anterior teeth and proximal surface when the upper lip is lifted. At a later stage, cavitation occurs and the lesion appears brown and dark brown. Eventually, the crowns may be destroyed to the gum line. But abscesses may develop and the child may suffer severe pain and discomfort. <clears throat> Anticipatory guidance is the process of providing practical, developmental, appropriate information about children's health to prepare parents for the significant physical, emotional, and psychological milestones. Involve both parent and child patient when age appropriate. Customized patient-centered recommendations 
presented orally, demonstration provided, and written documentation to be taken home for reference. Developmental milestones, nutrition and feeding, oral hygiene measures, dental caries prevention, and health and safety precautions and treatment measures are outlined in a table later on. Dietary and feeding pattern recommendations. Toddlers and preschoolers. Children need a series of small healthy meals during the day. Healthy snacks include non-carrogenic foods from the grain, vegetables, fruit, meat, uh, meat alternatives, and dairy groups. Sweetened foods and drinks are limited to three or less per day and provided at mealtimes rather than between meals. Do not allow the child to sip or graze at will on a bottle or sippy cup containing milk or sweet liquids which promote demineralization and ECC. Milk and water should be the primary beverages with no more than four to six ounces of juice per day with meals. School aged. Educate about healthy snacks and drinks. Encourage tooth healthy choices. School aged children continue to have problems with likes and dislikes. Choices are strongly influenced by both their physical and so social environments, easily accessible, parents' education, time constraints, ethnicity, eating together, TV viewing during meals, and the source of food, restaurants, schools, family, friends, and the media, uh, especially TV, influence their food choices. Parents have a direct role in the children's eating patterns through the behavior, attitudes, and feeding styles. Adolescence. Frequency of eating increases due to growth periods, emotional issues, and peer pressures. Cariogenic foods and drinks are often selected. Incidence of dental caries may increase during adolescence. Highest caries risk of any time in life for males exceeded only during pregnancy for females. Inadequate nutrition is common. Boys, due to overactivity and poor food selection. Girls, due to voluntary diet restrictions with poor food selections and fad diets to attempt to be trim. Teen with a distorted body image may take concern to extremes. Eating disorder, anorexia nervosa, and or bulimia can lead to severe health complications and even death. Successful treatment usually requires an interdisciplinary team approach involving medical care, psychotherapy, and nutrition and family counseling. Iron deficiency anemia, common among teenage girls, particularly after the onset of menstruation. Treated with an iron supplement, changes in diet, and or both. Oral health considerations for toddlers and preschoolers, gaining cooperation. At these ages, the child is becoming more independent. Parents can provide a fun activity by making up and singing a brushing song. For a two to three year old, teach the child to take turns with the parent when brushing by using the phrase, it's your turn to brush, followed by, it's my turn to brush. To gain better cooperation, connect brushing with a fun activity such as, first, we brush teeth and then we read a story. Provide a recommended two-minute timer to be used for motivation during brushing. Brushing and flossing. Establish a routine. Make suggestions as how to establish and maintain a brushing routine. Recommend brushing in the morning and after breakfast and before bedtime. Specify that the most critical time for dental biofilm removal is before bedtime. Parental involvement and supervision. Parents keep fluoride toothpaste out of the reach of the children and oversee. They place a correct amount of toothpaste on the toothbrush. Until the child develops fine motor coordination and can effectively remove biofilm, the parents' caregivers assist the child in cleaning the teeth by doing the brushing and flossing. The time to cease assistance depends on the parent and caregiver assessment and varies markedly from child to child. Parents teach the child to brush and then evaluate to ensure effective and complete biofilm removal. Parents floss clo closely approximated uh, primary teeth to remove biofilm from proximal surfaces. Toothpaste. Children's toothpaste manufactured in the United States contain the same amount of fluoride as adult toothpaste, whereas manufacturers in several countries around the world reduce the amount of fluoride in children's toothpaste. Parents, caregivers are informed that they need to prevent problems by controlling the amount of toothpaste used and placing it out of the child's reach. For children younger than six years, regularly ingesting pea-sized amounts or more can lead to mild fluorosis. Appropriate amount of fluoridated toothpaste is to be used for children of all ages. Children like the taste of toothpaste and may eat a large amount at one sitting, and resulting in fluoride toxicity. Instruction for parents. An adult can brush a child's teeth with a tiny amount of fluoridated toothpaste as soon as the first tooth comes in. Children younger than three years of old use a small smear layer of fluoride toothpaste. The amount is about the size of a grain of rice. Children who's, who are three years or older should use a pea-sized amount of fluoride toothpaste. Teach children to spit out toothpaste as soon as they are old enough to do so. Continue to control the toothpaste and keep it out of the reach. Teach parents how to examine the mouth for signs and gingival inflammation, dental caries, and injury. Evaluation of pits and fissures are for caries susceptible primary and permanent teeth, molars, premolars, and anterior teeth. 
speech and language development, premature loss of primary teeth, digit habits, and malocclusions can have direct implications on child's developmental and speech and language. Early detection and referral can help correct speech and language developments. Digit habits. Prolonged thumb and finger sucking habits have been associated with narrow maxillary arch with anterior open bite, posterior cross bite, increased overjet, and decreased overbite. Accident and injury prevention. Age-appropriate accident and injury prevention. Counseling for oral facial trauma is provided and evaluated at every hygiene visit. Written information regarding what to do in the event of traumatic oral injury makes parents feel more prepared. Toddlers. The greatest incidence of injury to the primary dentition occurs at two to three years of age. Toddlers have increased mobility and developing coordination and as a result are subject to injuries. Providing counseling and regarding play objects, pacifiers, car seats, and electrical cords. School age children. House structures, furniture such as floors, steps, tables, and beds are most commonly associated with dental injuries in children below the age of, of seven. Uh, parents can be taught to prevent the child by close supervision, anticipatory problems, and making the environment safe by removing dangers. Adolescents. Common injuries to permanent teeth are related to car accidents, violence, and sports-related uh, trauma. Counseling and providing athletic mouth guards for all contact sports and activities can enhance trauma prevention. Oral malodor, halitosis, causes biofilm buildup on the tongue and teeth, diet, dry mouth, low levels of saliva inhibit the ability to wash away food debris. Health conditions, infections in the nose, throat, or lungs, chronic sinusitis, postnatal drip, chronic bronchitis, or disturbances in your digestive system. Medications, mouth breathing, oral infections, dental caries, periodontal conditions, draining fistulas, oral surgery, oral sores, and smoking. <clears throat> What to teach parents? Explain bacterial causes. Emphasize thorough dental biofilm removal through daily brushing of the teeth. Teach how to floss the child's teeth. Show how to brush gently the dorsum of the tongue. Oral health considerations for adolescents. Increased risk for dental caries and periodontal infections during adolescence has already been described in this chapter. Some additional examples of oral problems related to adolescent development and behavioral characteristics, including risky health behaviors, are listed here. Assess the presence, position, and development of the third molars. Provide a referral if needed. Oral man manifestations of sexually transmitted infection. Potential effects of hormonal, hormonal fluctuations and the use of oral contraceptives on periodontal tissue. Oral findings of anorexia, nervosa, or bulimia. Traumatic injury to the teeth and oral structures. Contact sports and skateboarding are risky behaviors. Automobile and motorcycle accidents can also occur in dental injuries. If pregnancy and parenting are issues for the adolescent patient, the dental hygienist can use anticipatory guidance to educate about uh, important health, oral health issues, and the mother and the infant. Tobacco, obstructive sleep, apnea, piercings, and substance abuse. At the child approaches, as the child approaches adolescence, the prevention discussion can be expanded to include the serious health consequences of tobacco use, intraoral, perioral piercings, obstructive sleep apnea, OCA, and substance abuse. Smoking, smokeless tobacco, and, and exposure to secondhand smoke. Current tobacco trends, electric cigarettes, and hookah. Oral effects of tobacco, including leukoplakia, periodontal disease, and oral cancer. Discussion of identifiable signs, symptoms, and evaluation of OSA is a part of the child's regular clinical exam. Pediatric OSA is a disorder of breathing characterized by prolonged partial upper airway obstruction and or intermittent complete obstruction that disrupts normal ventilation during sleep and normal sleep patterns. The signs and symptoms of OSA include excessive daytime sleepiness, loud snoring three or more nights per week, episodes of breathing cessation witnessed by another person. Abrupt awakenings accompanied by shortness of breath, awakening with dry mouth and or sore throat, morning headaches, difficulty staying asleep, attention problems, mouth breathing, sweating, rest restlessness, waking up a lot, bedwetting, poor school performance. Um, but referral to the child's pediatrician if suspected of being at risk for OSA. Comorbidities with OSA can be cardiovascular problems, impaired growth, learning problems, and behavioral problems. Untreated OSA is a combination with insulin resistance and obesity in child sets the stage for heart disease and endocrinopathies. Discussion of complication and non-reversible non conditions that can result from intraoral perioral piercings include 
Oral piercings, including the tongue, lips, cheeks, and uvula, have been associated with pathological conditions, including pain, infection, scar formation, tooth fractures, metal, hypersensitivity reactions, localized periodontal disease, speech impediment, Ludwig angina, hepatitis, and nerve damage. Increased plaque levels, gingival inflammation, and or recession carries diminished diminished articulation and metal allergy. Life-threatening complications have been reported, including bleeding, edema, endocarditis, and airway obstruction. Use of dental in, dental jewelry <clears throat> or grills has been documented to cause dental caries and periodontal problems. The patient who has or is considering an oral piercing is educated regarding daily hygiene of the, the piercing site to avoid infection. Counsel at every dental visit regarding the possible complications. Encouraged to remove the piercings. Referral. Appropriate for referrals are made when the problems that require intervention by oral health providers are identified. Conditions required at referral include evidence of systemic illness and pathology, child abuse or neglect and evidence of poor parental skills, failure to provide safety measures, substance abuse and family, Understand the reporting and licensing requirements for child abuse and neglect specific to the state. Treatment planning and consent. The dental hygiene diagnosis is used to develop the dental hygiene care plan. Before treatment, the care plan is discussed with the dentist to integrate the dental hygiene plan into the comprehensive dental treatment plan. Inform the parent and guardian of the findings from the assessment and present the care plan to both orally and in writing. Have the parent or guardian sign an informed consent before treatment. Medical clearance. The parent and guardian will need to consent to medical clearance for conditions requiring antibiotic coverage, local anesthetic, and or other medication for a patient under the legal age. Parental approval. The dental hygienist care plan requires approval by the parent or guardian. Documentation. The following items are documented in the progress uh, notes of pediatric patients. Overall appraisal of physical status and key health history findings. Existing pathology, soft tissue, gingiva, caries, occlusal status. Oral hygiene status and caries risk assessment. Anticipatory guidance provided parent, patient recommendations, and any adjunct hygiene aids provided. Disclosing tablets, prescriptions, proxy brush, floss threader. Procedures co completed. Initial examination, recall examination, scaling and polishing, radiographs taken, types of fluoride provided. Child's behavior throughout the appointment and level of cooperation. Treatment plan for the next visit.